yeah, let me introduce Sadana shortly. Um, yeah, she she's a math graduate from Wits in Pilani, and despite that having a math graduate, uh, she's interested in programming, and so she pursued a career as a data scientist and has like 10 years of experience in Python. And the last two to three years, she explored C Python, so the reference implementation of Python that you, if you don't know what it is, you probably use it because it's the, like the default Python version. And yeah, if you didn't know that Python has a compiler, uh, even if it's uh, an interpreted language, then this talk will teach you the better because we will deep dive into C Python. And yeah, I'm really curious, so I will head over to you, Sadana. Thank you a lot. Hello. So Right, thank you. Um, as he said, I am a data scientist and I accidentally started looking into C Python because of one of my older projects where I needed to mess around with Python, try to recompile it just to see if I didn't need to make my code better. But that was fun. And if you ever want to reach out to me or talk more about C Python, which I'm always willing to do, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. So without further ado, um, what is C Python? Uh, everybody here, presumably, codes in Python. Um, if you don't, why are you here? But you're still welcome. Um, so you write all of these .py files, and these files need to be converted into something the machine can understand. And that is what CPython does. And CPython is the reference implementation. It is the version that Guido van Rosen started before I was born. And there are alternatives, such as um, PyPy, which is written entirely in Python. You have Ion Python, which is a compiler which allows Python to be run through .NET frameworks, and it's written in Java. And you have Stackless, which is MicroPython, which allows a lot of microthreading. Um, the only commonality between all of these is that they respect the grammar rules of Python. And today, we're going to talk specifically about CPython because it's the one I like, and I'm the one giving the talk. So what can you expect today? Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick intro to CPython, all of the steps. You will not be an expert by the end of this talk, but you should be able to read the code. The CPython code base is written in C, and it is the most readable code base that I have ever seen, um, even though it's not in Python. And the idea is that you will know what happens, and therefore you won't be entirely lost. Um, we're going to talk about the compiler steps. And then we're going to talk about the interpreter steps. The compiler takes the code, converts it into opcodes eventually. And these opcodes are what eventually gets run by the interpreter. And we will talk about each of these terms later. I did say compiler, and I didn't just say interpreter. CPython does have a compiler. And it does always run whenever you execute your code. And this is because you always need to go from source code to opcode. And only the compiler does this. It is the compilation step. The reason why Python is known as an interpreted language is because almost all of the hard work in running a program is done by the interpreter. OK, we're going to talk about the program that I'm going to use today as an example. It is the most complicated program you've seen all day. It's this. You're going to take a number, you're going to square it, you're going to print the output, and that's complicated. So the steps. We're first going to talk about the interpreter of course, I mean the compiler, of course. The compiler has three steps. First, you need to take the source code itself, and you're going to tokenize it, which we will talk about. You're going to parse it into an AST, which is an abstract syntax tree, which then gets converted to a CFG. I put a star there because what happens is slightly more complicated. And then the CFG gets flattened into a straight list of opcodes which then is handed over to the interpreter. So the tokenizer, what does it do? So you've written this great program, and you've given it uh, to Python. You say, Python, run this file.py. And it looks at it, and all it sees is a string. It has to take the string, and it has to break it up into chunks that mean something to the code. So if you say def, uh, square, and then open bracket, num and then close bracket colon, it, it will take def and make it into a name. 
It's going to take square and say, hey, this is a name. It's going to look at the open bracket and say, this is an operator, and so on and so forth. I'll show you the output in the next slide. Um, it is also here that if you use characters that Python doesn't like, or if you use really stupid variable names and things like this, it's going to give you an error. And that, this is where that happens. Okay. Um, this is a flowchart of exactly how this code is going to work. It's really going to go character by character. And then it's going to check, is this a new line character? Is this the start of a name? Is this going to be, if you've already in a name, is this going to be the end? Is this the beginning of you know, your double equal to? And so on and so forth. And if you don't really fit anywhere, it's going to give you an error. You will see this quite often. There's a lot of if and switch in the Python code base, which is nice when you're trying to read it, because it's easy. Um, this is the actual output. Um, you can do this for any file. You can also do this for any code base. I don't recommend it for code bases, obviously. Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't recommend it for code bases, obviously. Um, but for our little code, it fits onto the screen. And basically, what it does is if we look at the, the first one is just the encoding. It's at the zeroth position, and it started at zero. We can ignore that. If you go to the next line, it says on the first line, at the zeroth position, the, um, uh, the token for def begins. It goes, it's in the zeroth first, and then it ends at three. And it does this for every single token which is there in the file. Um, you have indentations here, you have the new lines, and you have all of the operators. OK. And this entire thing is passed on to the parser. The parser looks at these list of tokens, and it says, hey, I can take this, and I can actually fit it into the grammar. And that's what the parser does. Um, I couldn't actually get a representation of the parser. Somehow, that's not supported, and I couldn't file a program that does it. Uh, but what the, whatever the parser outputs is converted into a list of opcodes and a CFG. But this list of opcodes is not flat. This list of opcodes is just for each of these chunks that we've written, each of these ifs, what are the list of codes that we need to run in the interpreter. And then you have the actual control flow in the control flow graph, which we will talk about in a bit. Um, and the parser is where all of the syntax checking happens. Um, if you write if A equals B and somebody tells you that's wrong, the parser is telling you, not the interpreter. Um, and yes, the, the way I said it, it also accepts certain things that are technically not OK in Python's grammar. And it does this simply to give you a much better error message than if it just said, hey, I don't like the syntax. So what is the AST? Um, the AST, the full form, is an abstract syntax tree. And each node in the abstract syntax tree is going to represent a statement or a specific um, expression or a type that is accepted by Python. List comprehensions have a separate grammar for them. And the way it's written is that other than the grammar itself that exists in the Python code base, you're going to have the grammar re-implemented in such a way that it is not ambiguous at all. Um, the specific parser that we use to do this and generate the AST is called PEG. If you want to later look into it, it's the parsing expression grammar. And you rewrite that grammar, and then you get good errors. Hopefully, you get no errors, which is then converted into the control flow graph along with the list of opcodes. Now, what the control flow graph is, um, if you write a program, and let's say you call a function. In your, you're saying in, in our program itself, you define the function. It's there in the main flow. And then you're calling this other function, which is square. The control has to pass to this new function call that you're doing. And then it has to come back to the original flow that you have. Same with the for loop. You start the loop. You keep going within that loop, the control, and then you exit. All of this sort of control, where it goes, is handled by the control flow graph. And both of these, the, the non-flattened opcode list is generated, and the control flow graph is generated for our extremely complicated program. Uh, this is what the control flow graph looks like. You have the oval one, which is the main, which calls 
print, which actually calls square, and that's it. But if you have a more complicated core base, this one you can actually generate on a core base. If you have it in a more complicated place, um, the graph looks nicer. So you have this, and finally, the compiler outputs this. And what this is, is the disassembly of your Python code. And this is the formal name. Um, and what you have is on the first line, if you see zero load constant, load underscore const is an opcode. What opcodes are is something that I will touch on later. But you have each of these different opcodes. And then separately, you have the disassembly for the function. Of code is rather simple, so this list is not very long. But again, you can generate this for anything. Um, and then we actually move on to the interpreter. The interpreter gets this huge list of opcodes. It computes go to, which we will again talk about. And then it executes the code, which is all we really see. Now, the interpreter is really just one big loop. This specific code snippet did exist in Python, but it doesn't anymore. But I still really like it, because it's the first time that I really saw an infinite loop just there in production code. And it actually made sense that it was there. And if you actually look at older versions of Python, you will find this. And you had run this in your system at some point. And so it's this really one big for loop that has a bunch of if else, basically a switch case, if you are familiar with C, uh, switch cases is slightly better if else. And so for each opcode in that list that we saw before, it takes that opcode, checks what opcode it is, and it executes that opcode. This is an example of execution. Load fast is just an opcode to load a variable. Um, if the variable exists, it does some checking, it tries to load it. And if it doesn't load, that's an error. Let's say you want to load a variable that doesn't exist in memory for some reason, like we all have in production. And you get an error. And when you have that variable in your system, you want to increment the reference to it so that the garbage collector can later work on it. And then you push that value onto the stack. If um, you, know, you need it and you need to keep it, if it's a new frame, if it's a new function, whatever, you push that value onto the stack. And then you go to fast dispatch. This is a preview. We're going to come back to this when we talk about computed go to basically next. Um, and that's basically what happens for each and every opcode. You're going to get the actual thing that should happen. Let's say you have binary operation where you need to add or multiply. The, it's going to try to do that operation. If it gets an error, it's going to throw you that error. If it doesn't, it's going to clean up. And it's going to go to the next top code. OK, I'm going to quickly take a break and ask if you guys have any questions. Yes. OK, on the list of tokens, when you showed an example, I noticed there are two separate kinds of tokens for new line. One is called NL, and one is called new line. You know why? Um, OK, this I'm going to quickly go back. The reason I'm doing this is because I don't want anybody to not follow the rest. Um, new line and NL. Yes, the first new line actually matters for indentation. The second one is just me writing clean code. OK. Um, if there are no other questions, and if everybody is with me so far, we can actually talk about what are these opcodes that I've been so happy about. An opcode is an instruction. Um, it is not an instruction at the machine level. At the machine level, you're just going to be like, move a bit here and there, and you're actually going to talk to the machine. This is not at that level. We're still super high level at this point. Um, but an opcode is um, an a, a let's say, a binary operation. It's never going to change. If you get two integers and you want to add it, the code that you need to do that is never going to change. It's one of those um, unchanged bits of execution that you have in your code, like call a function, um, load a variable, add two integers, add two floats. That's what opcodes are. 
all of these are opcodes, like I've already said. Um, you have a whole lot of them. Make function does something very different from call function. Um, it actually loads everything associated with that. Yes, it is assembly. Um, you have return value, which actually returns the value from the function. So each of these different bits that Python does that you take for granted is an opcode. There aren't very many, and you can see the entire list of them in the code base, which is really cool. Um, for ex and these do get changed. Um, for example, when they allowed await and async as keywords, they had to add new opcodes. Now we're going to talk about two of my favorite optimizations in the code base. Um, the code base has changed a lot in the last three years that I've been following it. And you might have also noticed that your programs are running faster. And two of the major optimizations are what we're going to talk about now. The first is a computed go-to. Everybody here knows what a go-to is, right? Yes. So you, if you have a static go-to, you always see the statement, and then you go to that exact line of code that the go-to tells you to go to. Now, past dispatch that I gave a preview for before is what computed go-tos are. Instead of saying you have this huge switch case, and essentially what you're doing is you're trying to get to the correct start of what you need to execute. Now, how do you do that without going through the switch case? And that's what computed go-tos are. They have a way to say, hey, I have this opcode. The line where the execution for this opcode starts is here, and just jump there. And it's computed go-to because you're doing a go-to, but the line that you're going to is computed. And that is handled by fast dispatch. So you compute using fast dispatch for your current opcode. You go there, execute, go back to fast dispatch, and you do it again until you have no more opcodes. As we've seen before, that's always the last line. And this is true of every single um, case in the big switch. This um, specializing adaptive interpreter is also another, um, I forgot to mention, the last one actually gave you the 3x speed up that you saw going from Python 2 to 3. Um, this one gives you a 25% speed up from Python 11. I'm um, sorry, Python 3.11. Um, it's called a specializing adaptive interpreter. It's a very fancy name for something very simple, but very cool. Um, and it's exactly as the name says, though, the interpreter adapts to the way your code is written. So to actually give you a concrete example, let's say you have a list comprehension. And that list comprehension just has a list of numbers, and you're just going to multiply the numbers by two, for example. And if you look at each operation that's happening, for each number, you're just multiplying it by two. So it's two, one integer multiplied by another integer. So you don't need to go to the general version of binary op, where it's going to say, hey, I have two numbers, check if they're int, check if they're float, do the right operation for them. It's just going to directly go to the specialized one and say, hey, I have two integers, just execute. So a lot of the checking and the error handling is eliminated. Now, of course, if you have this big list and you randomly throw a float in it, it's going to be wrong. But the trade-off that we're doing is that for let's say the list is a thousand elements and you have one float, we are correct 99% of the time. And for the one example where we just got a float, we are wrong. And so overall, it gives us a speed up and where we're wrong, we're slightly slower. And how this is handled is now all of the new um, op instructions, you have a warm up counter, which counts down from the particular warm up for that op code. And once it hits zero, it specializes to whatever specialized operation you're repeatedly using. And if you miss too many times, it goes back to the general instruction. And you have a miss counter, which also counts down from a specific number for each opcode. Um, this is the specializing adaptive interpreter. There is a lot going on behind the scenes. I gave you the simple surface explanation for it. If you want to see exactly what it is, you can look at PEP 659. PEP is a Python enhancement proposal, and all of Python's changes go through PEPs. OK, we're almost done. 
let's actually execute the program. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about frames, because it's a little bit relevant to what we're doing. Let's say this, it's supposed to be purple, but this black box is all of the uh, memory that Python has access to. And let's say this is a specific stack that's there within that memory. What frames do is they allow you to handle context. And Python does this by having the stack, and in the stack, it adds frames. Frames maintain all of references to all of the variables available within that context. So you're going to have all of this in a stack, so the main one is going to be in the bottom. Functions get added on top and popped off when they're no longer needed. So I hope we remember our very complicated program and we start executing it. You have this global frame, um, which, as we just talked about, is where all of the main functions, um, all of the global variables, everything exists here. So the first thing that happens is it, okay, first thing that happens is it adds square to that global frame, which is the function that gets defined first. So the reference to that function is there. And then it adds your print, it adds two, which is the number that we were passing to square. So that variable is still existing in the global context. So you add all of that to the global context. Next thing you're doing is actually calling square, and square is a different function. So you have a different frame created for it, and you pass two to it. It does the computation. It has the return value, which is four. I hope you know that. Yes, I know that. Um, so that's four, and it has a return value. Then square gets destroyed because you don't need it anymore, and print gets added on top along with the four. Print gives you the output. Print is destroyed. The global thing is destroyed. And you see finally on your interpreter or wherever you're running it, the output four. And that's basically it. That took us, I don't know, I think 25 minutes, 20 minutes to execute that program. Normally it takes much faster, but I hope this was fun. Thank you a lot. I hope there are questions in the audience. Oh, yeah. They're in the back. Come on. Uh, if someone wants to get a deeper insight in these topics, can you recommend anything that is slightly going to bring you more and more information without Overwhelming because I, 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 I imagine it gets really quick, really complicated. Yes. Um, what I would recommend is actually focusing on each component. Uh, we've talked about quite a few, and each of them is really complicated on its own. And GC is something that I realized I wouldn't have time to touch, but that's also very interesting garbage collection. Each of these, I would say the entry point is still the documentation, and after that, there are specific talks about this. But in the end, you're going to have to read the code. And believe me, the code is extremely readable. I don't know how they wrote code like that, but my god. Maybe a follow-up question. What interesting things can you then have to do with your knowledge? Uh, if I remember your work in data science, how does this help you to work in data science knowing this stuff? So. Um, it doesn't directly impact my day-to-day -day work, other than me knowing that list comprehensions are really great after Python 3.11, and you should really use them. Um, but the, the reason why I started looking into it is because I needed to do something very specific using SymPy to make sure that I could write a neural network in such a way that a quantum annealer could solve this network. And that took a huge amount of effort. And I needed the recursion limit to be different. I needed a bunch of things to be different. So I just compiled a Python for my own. That's where I started. Um, after that, I just fell in love with the code base. There's another question over there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. So imagine that I have my simple program pi file in my editor. What steps I need to do to, well, to go deeper and deeper, like to kind of start watching those operators parsing, uh, anything like, are there any tools or what 
what the workflow would look like if um, I want to so take, if, look, take a look inside. Okay, so if you want to do this, the first thing that you would do is write the program, save it, and then I actually have the command in a few slides, I think. Yeah. Uh, which, and if you want to look at the tokenizer output, you just say python m tokenize file name, and it gives you the output for the tokenizer. The disassembly is similar. You say python m dis. Um, in terms of getting the AST and the CFG, the CFG, the one that I showed you, is a re-implementation re of Python CFG. So it's not going to be exactly the same one that Python generates, but it's going to be similar enough for you to get the general idea. Um, what else? The opcodes you get from this. And there are all, if you want to look at the frames themselves, that's a little bit harder, but there are implementations which kind of show you, but you can't see it directly in Python unless, you know, you're just right having breakpoints and stepping through the code, which is going to take you a long time. But you can do that. Are there other questions from the audience? I don't see any hands. All right. So um, you talked about recent optimizations in Python uh, 3.11. Uh, as far as I know, there were, was an effort to improve performance since Python 3.9, like a heavy focus. Yes. So can you tell like the highlights that were? Or... Well, this is one of the highlights. There is a project called Fast C Python or Faster C Python, yeah. and it's headed by Mark Shannon. And he has an actual full talk about all of this. But uh, my favorite one was actually the specializing one. They optimized also the way data is represented in the Python data model and how memory is accessed. But that, for that, go to that talk um, okay. by Mark Shannon. I think it was EuroPython 2022. EuroPython 2022. Yes. Okay, thanks. And did you also look into how PyPy does it differently? I think the main thing about PyPy is that it's a, a just-in-time uh, compiler, right? Yes. So it's completely different architecture, I guess. and. I haven't really looked into any other code base. CPython usually takes most of my time. Um, but I just know that it's different. And I'm assuming that PyPy is a little bit easier to read because it's written in Python. But then if you actually write production code in Python, it stops becoming easy to read. So take that with a pinch of salt. All right. Are there further questions from the audience? Oh, I see one over there. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Uh, maybe I have a tangent question, but like while you are following Python so closely, maybe you have some insights. So I have heard recently that there are some plans in the future versions to have a version via, without the global interpreter lock. So yes. Can you give any insight about that? Yes, I'm actually going to give an entire talk about that in um, <laughs> PyCon Ireland. I'm very excited about this. The GIL is going away. There is actually a fully functional version of Python without the GIL. Um, it's called the No GIL Project. Uh, removing the GIL has been years long effort and it's happening. It's going to happen, I think, in the next five years. At least that's what the time, uh, timeline was. Uh, there is a PEP to remove this. I don't remember the PEP number, but there is a PEP to remove this. And it might come in Python 3 if there is no disruption to any of the APIs. Um, but in all likelihood, it will definitely come to Python 4. All right, are there further questions? Doesn't look like it. Oh, over there, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering, so this whole opcode and then interpreter thing, that's very similar to like what the JVM does, right? It has, it has this uh, Java bytecode thing. And, and there, the, I think the idea is that, well, there are different languages that all, compare, that all compile to the same like opcodes, and then you have like different JVMs and they all run it, right? Um, do you know if there's anything except C Python that generates the same opcodes? Is that because in principle I could do that, right? I could <laughs> compile a different language to this thing, or is it just a C Python thing? I don't know. Okay. I have no idea what other languages do. Hmm. Um, one other thing that I would be curious about is can I somehow hook into C Python and uh, after the abstract syntax tree and generate something else. Because uh, my, my former job at one point, we actually parsed Python ourselves and generated C code out of it to have kind of like um, code that can be easily used for debugging in Python, but then in the end product be compiled to uh, Python. And we didn't want to use 
Cyton uh, because it was uh, uh, code wasn't portable enough for a platform. So do you have insight on that? Um, so you want to write Python code, get the C code that's there in the uh, in the op code list, and then have a C program instead of a Python program. Yeah, more or less like that. So maybe just hook into the. I think in the end we just use the the est module and then work on the S directly. So is this the proper way to, to hook I, into? I would do that because okay. um, the C code that is there in the op codes also has to handle the fact that, um, you know, it, it's not all specialized most of the time. And if you are actually directly compa compiling to C, you're doing it because you want to be really fast. And then the interpreter is not really great. For that. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, AST and then C code is... What I okay. would do if I had to do it. All right. Are there further questions from the audience? We would still have a few minutes. Uh, I don't see any raised hands. So then let's have a short break until the next talk. So thanks again. <laughs>